Hello everyone and welcome to the Designer Diaries for Nightmare Cathedral. Uh, this is a time when I, Wazik Kubacki, the designer of Nightmare Cathedral, will talk to you a little bit about how the game was kind of conceived and conceptualized. And I allowed myself to name this Unsettling Dreams, or in other words, how night nightmares become dreams and art becomes game design. So let's talk a little bit about Nightmare Cathedral, but before we start talking about Nightmare Cathedral, let's talk a little bit about the art. What you see here are just four of many, many ama amazing pieces of art created by Zdzisław Beksiński. He was one of the most influential Polish visual artists known to us, and he created incredible images which were at the same time visionary, spanning, at times sometimes disturbing, um, definitely dark at times, and dystopian. Now, there are many interpretations and many things that happen to people as they look at Bekshinsky's art. But one thing I think is pretty certain. This is art that works on us. This is something that if you've seen it at least once, you will probably remember those images well. And um, this, is, this was the first step. This was the first step in creating a game. Finding something that would create a certain level of commonality or finding inspiration in those images. So the first question which I faced as I started designing the game was one that is very simple, but at the same time, very big. How do you translate an artistic, how do you translate artistic visions into game mechanisms? How do you look at those images and think about a game that these could be built around, built using with? What is there that could create a game? And the truth is that while Zdzisław Bekszyński had the style that is really characteristic and his images are easily recognizable, it's also not something that you can easily put your finger on. I mean, this is, they, like I said, these images definitely are something that is memorable and something that leaves an impression. But I guess there are different impressions we could be talking about. So one thing I think is rather certain, there is a certain atmosphere to these images. And again, as I was thinking for the first time about making this game, I tried to ask myself the question, how do you capture the atmosphere of these unique images? And they are unique both in the sense that they are unique as a body of work of one artist, something that is very unique to this artist, this artist's style. But also, they are often unique in themselves. As I said, you, just, you, you can just see four images which, are, which definitely have something in common, but at the same time, they also are very different and they feel as if they were coming from different worlds. Now, as I went into this further, I started also thinking more in the terms of um, a true game designer. In a way, someone who is facing the idea of creating a game, if you, if you will, also a product, something that can be put in a box, something that can be, uh, something that can have actual boundaries. And the next question, and one which I managed to kind of answer as I started this road, was who is this game for? So anyone who looks at this game will come from two main groups of people. So basically, are you here because you love the artist, you love his work, you know exactly those images, and you want to see them um, used in a game? Or perhaps you are here because you love the art, 
you don't know that you, you don't know Zdzisław Beksiński, but you have seen his art. You have seen maybe pieces of art that were influenced by his style. Because again, he was a very influential artist and a lot of his visions found often continuations in people who wanted to continue the style or homage him. Or finally, are you here because you are a gamer? Now, these two groups may already overlap. I am sure that there are many gamers who, at one point or another, bumped into Bekshinsky's art. Or perhaps they were completely separately from their gaming hobby fans of Zdzisław Bekshinsky. Either way, there is already a group of both gamers and Bekshinsky's fans. But there are undoubtedly people who will be interested in the game itself first and foremost, and then look at this amazing art as an incredible and fascinating bonus. And on the other hand, we will definitely get a lot of people who um, will know the art, who will be fans of the artist and his body of work or of specific images, who will find out that there is a board game. And it is quite possible that many of the people looking at the game will be either very light gamers or people taking their first steps as they learn the game of Nightmare Cathedral. Thinking about this, I decided that there should be three pillars that are going to hold this design, much like the three pillars you see in this image. And yes, it is quite possible that there is a fourth pillar hiding behind those. But what we see here are the three pillars and the character that is looking at us from behind one of them. And those three very important pillars of designing this game would be, firstly, the accessibility of mechanisms. If you are a person who has um, gamed very little, if you are a person who has only tried a few of the tried and true classics in your life, you should be able to at least enter this world through the game and be able to make your a couple of first steps. So one of the design goals and one of the pillars of the design of this game was to make it accessible. At the same time, the second important thing about this specific games was to deliver a complexity of options. And let me stop here for a second to talk about what complexity of options means. I often say that when that for a game to be good, you have to have um, interesting and meaningful choices. Actually, that's something a lot of people will say. But I am of the opinion that the number of those choices doesn't need to be vast. At any given situation, a number of options may be limited but they should be meaningful and interesting options. And this is one of the ideas I wanted to convey in this game from a purely mechanical standpoint. You don't need to, every time, consider five, eight things. It is enough if you consider two or three, but all of them meaningful. All of them that will allow you to move forward in your game, to choose your strategy, to adapt your, to, to choose maybe your tactics, to adapt your strategy. Finally, the third very important pillar was to respect the source material. Now, this is also something that is a very interesting, uh, and a very interesting idea because often when you create a game that uses a certain type of license, you have more than visual material. Quite often, any visual material is only a part of what you could call, for example, lore. If you are working on a game that happens in a specific world, in a specific setting, in a specific place that uses characters and their stories, uh, you have this to mostly base your game mechanisms, your game ideas on. And any visuals are a bonus. Here, the visuals are the material. And the question is, what kind of a story will be, will be told in such a way that 
you can incorporate many of those materials, many of those images which uh, create very different landscapes, very different, should they say, dreamscapes into one game. What could be done to basically uh, take those images and create some sort of a story that would then translate into game mechanisms? Again, these were the questions I was going through as I was starting this process. But very quickly, I decided that these are the three main elements of designing this game. Now, let's talk about those two points mainly in a close focus. Actually, all three of them. But firstly, let's talk about the game mechanisms and how they can easily speak to people who have limited experience with board games. So the first thing I decided to start from was a recognizable template. When you look at board games, you can see that there are dozens of different genres and subgenres, many ideas and many ways to approach any type of material, not only one that is so specific and at the same, at the same time so incredible as Bekshinsky's art. In this case, I decided that, I, that what we want to do is we want to start from something that is going to be instantly recognizable, both for heavier gamers and for people who have a limited experience with gaming, which is why I started from what I like to call a recognizable template. Now, the, this recognizable template was from one of the games that everybody seems to know, and that is Risk. Risk and before you start running away, it is just the basic idea because Risk is one of those seminal games that so many of us have played when we were kids. It is the idea of taking over regions, taking over pieces of the map, and then the idea of having units which you're going to manage and move around the map, having something to build, having ways to generate those units and entering conflicts with other players. It is a very simple template and one that is easily understandable by both people who played few games and have limited experience with board games, if any, and for people who have been playing games for years. Games that focus on area control, uh, games that focus on conflict on a map where you're positioning and your, let's say, power structure is important, are also a staple of what we call designer games, of gamers' games. Games. So it seemed that this will be a very solid option to start from. And that, in a way, guaranteed a simplicity of basics of this game. Because when somebody asks you what you're going to be doing in this game, you can easily say you're going to have a certain number of units, you're going to try to spread out on the map in a specific way, taking different regions. You're going to build your forts, which will help you keep those regions and help you produce more units. And then this is, in a nutshell, a very, very basic structure of the game. And it follows also a simple structure. You move around the map, you build your bases, you fight other players. Again, these are all concepts that are known both to gamers, heavy gamers, and light gamers or inexperienced gamers alike. So these were, this was the beginning. But that beginning also had a couple of underlying ideas. Since those things happened at the same time, it's very hard to me to, um, to tell you where everything begins because it all feels a little bit like a circle. But I promise that as we go on, you will see also those elements. Now, the next thing that had to happen is adding a little bit of specific flavor, which is why there was the idea of planning your actions. Now, what you see here in this image is the top side of the board. And the pieces, the three pieces, the um, blue one, the purple one, and the green one are pieces which are called the dreamers. Those are used 
in order to select your actions. Planning your actions is a little bit of a game in itself because every time, every turn, you will have a selection of actions, but this selection will always be cut down to either two or three actions, dependent on the position of your pawn, of your dreamer. And as I said previously, it is important for you to have meaningful choices, but it is also important uh, that the number of choices does not overwhelm you. Due to this positioning here, you will always know which actions are available to you, which actions are not available to you right now. You will also know that by making a specific move, you will perform an action while at the same time making some of the actions unavailable to you on your next turn. It's a simple and condensed system that allows you to make meaningful choices, make short-term and long-term plans, and those long-term plans come in as you become more experienced with the game, while at the same time not overwhelming you with everything you can do at a given time. This system always creates, also creates another important boon of the game. It is what I like to call, it's always your turn. Now, the light spaces you see here are spaces which allow you to pick an action. The dark spaces, known as night spaces, allow you to follow certain actions. So your positioning between your turns is also important. Because if an opponent is performing an action that is a uh, that is present on a space you're next to, just like the blue is right next to purple, you will be able to use an extra effect. Many of you might know this as a lead follow mechanism, and this is essentially what is used here. If you are close enough to your opponent, and if you are able to at the same time pick your action and perhaps foresee the action of your opponent, you'll be able not only to do what you want on your turn, but also on then, their turn, you will be able to profit from their action. In simple terms, every action has its main effect, its conform effect, so one that you can choose only if you are positioned correctly, and, uh, one, and one effect which you can only choose which is the only option if somebody performs that action but you are too far, just like the green dreamer in this image. This means that while you have important decisions on your turn, you also have the option to take opportunities during other player turns. Now, all of this may sound, may sound pretty complicated. You have effects and then effects which come into the game if you are positioned correctly and if you are positioned further you cannot use a given effect luckily this the next step was a step towards making the game simpler which is why every action is clearly visible on your card this was one of the important decisions because um as the game progresses, you will be able to modify those actions. Every action, just like you can see in this image, comes in, well, at least three varieties. There is a starting version of it, and this is where everybody starts equal. Most of your actions will be identical to those of your opponents when you start the game, and by most I mean four out of five, because the one of your actions will always be different. And then, the exact detail of this action are going to be clearly explained on the card in front of you. So while the game can offer certain nuances and certain complexity in itself, you will be always able to see what, as, how a certain rule works. And as the game progresses, you'll be able to upgrade your actions into ones that are more complex, but also more interesting, but also... Um, more uh, advantageous to you, and every time you'll be able to see what your actions do exactly. But the other elements, since we already had cards in the game, we decided that, well, since we already have cards in the game, why don't we make them multi-use? Which is why you can see on two of those cards what is called a combat effect. So the card, every single card you ever have, 
can either be played for its effect, and some of them are upgrades, some of them are immediate effects, but it can also be used as a basic resource whenever you are in combat, in conflict with other players or neutral units to generate effects, combat effects, uh, pretty much two combat effects, which is attack and defense. And this is one idea which actually I had already the opportunity to talk about, which is what I like to call one is many. One of the things that we're going to see on many images of Zdzisław Bekszyński is one thing that is also another thing. We can see a face that is also a city. So in this case, what I felt like an element of the atmosphere of these images that can be implemented into the game is that most of the elements serve more than one function. And depending on what stage of the game you are, uh, or depending on what you are doing exactly, what action you are performing, a given element can serve multiple function. And this is why the cards, at the same time, serve their function as the printed effects, as well as a combat boost. Now, finally, this is exactly... This, this is exactly the rules at your fingertips idea, because as you play the game, 95% of the rules you will need in order to play the game are on your cards. They are in the rule book, but you will always be able to refer to everything by looking at a given card. You will know what the main effect of a given action is. You will know what is the effect when you conform, so when you are positioned correctly. Uh, when you are positioned close to the active player, or to descend, this is when you are not positioned uh, close, but you are positioned further in the matrix from the active player. And this is a little bit of this idea. One is many. When you look at this image by Zdzisław Bekszyński, you can see that at first glance, it is a tree. But as you keep looking at it more and more, you'll see that this is a, a, a tree that is like no other. It is a tree, but also a rock formation. And in a way, all the interpretations of this are something that, uh, that spoke to me, that everything you see in the game can be used in more than one way. Okay, let's go back to the game. So following this idea, there are different types of units in the game. What you see here from top to bottom are your shapers, your dreamers, and shadows. Shadows are basically neutral units. They are pretty much the same as your own units called followers. Followers are units that you use primarily as to, to take over the map. And you use them, of course, to also fight other players or to fight shadows. But apart from this function and the function of, and their function in the conflict, and again, the conflicts in the game are something that is supposed to be um, means to an end. I will be talking about this a little bit later. But um, the your units are also a part of this mutability of the game idea because units are used not only to fight other players, but also as a resource, a resource needed in building uh, further forts, but also a, a resource needed for one of the most important elements of strategy in the game itself. Sorry, let this was a bit too this was a bit too far now one of the most important strategies of the game is climbing what is called the ritual track basically a track that requires you to spend resources and the only resource you can spend there are your units so at the same time you need them to take position on the board you need them to build your basis of power which is the forts which are the forts and you need to spend them as resources to move up the ritual track, which will score your points at the end of the game. This is one of the very important methods of this. At this, You have one element, which is at the same time um, a unit and two types of resources, 
and um, and it is something that corresponds to this idea of one being many. Now, let's talk a little bit about waking nightmares. One of the very important elements of the game are nightmares. As the centerpiece, the literal centerpiece of the game, the cathedral is built right in the middle, the game at one point changes. When the cathedral is complete, a new type of piece appears on the board. It's called a nightmare. Now, when I looked at some of the images, I knew that some of them are basically, some of them feel very, in a way, organic. Or if not organic, then they feel like entities, like some sort of an incredible, um, like some sort of an incredible uh, inhabitant of this world or these worlds created by Bekshinsky. And I decided that those which seem to make the greatest impression should also be able to impress on the game the most, which is why there is a set of nightmares, units which there are multiple of, but you're going to be using only two every game. And nightmares come with their own little rules card, one which you can see here, and every time they come in, they change the way subtly. They shift it so that from the moment the cathedral is built and the nightmares are available, and they are a type of a neutral unit which you, through your strategy or through clever play, you can gain temporary control, very temporary control of. They come with their own abilities which mm, correspond to their visuals in ways sometimes subtle and sometimes very obvious. And then as you, as you gain control over them, you create this new set of rules and this new way of playing the game which comes into the second half of the game. This was also quite important, especially for some of your first games where you have this period where you can really get, uh, when, when you can really get a grasp on the game as, as it is played before a slightly more complex element that needs your special attention is actually uh, put in the game itself. Now, like I said, the important thing is that when the nightmares are awoken, there are rules that are changing. But once again, the rules are at your fingertips. The nightmares come with their own cards, and every time you want to reference something, you can easily see it on the table. By the way, this is a bit of a this is going a bit further than than just design of the game. We made sure that those cards are big uh, and easy to reference during the game. This also means that your game is going to evolve. The moment that cathedral is built, big changes are going to come to your game of Nightmare Cathedral. Changes in strategy, changes in approach. There are new options that are going to open once that cathedral is built. Now, um, with that, it is important to know that you will know what nightmares you're going to awake the moment you sit down, the moment you set up the game. So you can prepare, but you can also, especially if this is one of your first game, you will be able to reference them quickly and then take another look at them as they become important. And a little bit more about respecting the source material, which is something I wanted to, to mention closer to the uh, closer kind of to, to, to the back end of the presentation is, as you can see, um, one of the ways to respect the source material is to, is to show it in a way that will give it justice. Now, you might say that this is not exactly something that can be done already when the game is being designed. But the truth is that some of the ideas, and I mentioned it earlier during uh, this presentation, that there were things that I was already thinking when, when I was designing the game. So some of the very basic ideas were there from the start. Giving the ability to, for example, 
show the nightmares as 3D creations with respect to detail was something which I kind of have in mind right from the start, that we can take some of those very evocative images, and if they are entities that will move around the board, we can give them a 3D depiction that takes that image and makes and takes it kind of a step further, makes it really something that leaves an extra impression. Now, while we are on the topic of respecting the source material, one of the most important elements of respecting the source material would be to give a certain fair treatment to the images we would be using in the game. And while the decision to make this a game that is played through controlling regions while the decision to take one of the most basic and most well-known game mechanisms in the world was kind of a decision made based on how I wanted this game to speak to different types and different, let's say, level of experience of gamers, I also knew that by creating a game which, uh, which has those multiple regions, firstly, we will have the opportunity to show those different landscapes, those different spheres of existence, to put some of the most visionary pictures that show those, those incredible vistas in the game. But the second thing, which was already part of the design, was making sure that the game plays over a certain number of these, in a sense that allowing us to make those images big enough and they are big both for your comfort as you move the miniatures around the board, but also so that we could really respectfully show all of those images in all their glory on this magnificent board that was then filled with some amazing art that was close to the atmosphere created by Bekshinsky's images. And now, one final look at what is the game now close to its final form? As you can see, uh, with the cathedral centerpiece in the middle and the actions, the sets of rules right in front of you, it is a game of conflict. It is a game of movement. It is a game of uh, kind of a game that is shifting, that is evolving, and that makes you adapt to different situations. And with this, and a game, I hope that you will find not only interesting, but also one that kind you kind of draws you in into this world of dreams, visions, and nightmares coming from uh, from the works of Zdzisław Bekszynski. And with this, I will say thank you. And I am ready for any questions that you might have. Okay. So... Um, all right, I think um, I have a question here in yesterday's playthrough. I couldn't help um, putting your followers on the board is to use them for the ritual track. So it is not really an area control game. I was even surprised no points were given to areas controlled by you. Yes, that is true. Just holding areas is not something that is going to win you the game. There is one very important element which I haven't exactly talked during the presentation in the game, and these are what are called the dream cards. This game is based on objectives. So one of the very important ways to win the game is to follow your objectives right from the start. They are something that's going to guide you through the game, that will tell you how to, how to develop your own little part of this, uh, of this nightmarish world, but they will also often give you points for specific things. Now, the, it's usually a very obvious answer in the game to simply spread yourself everywhere around the board. And 
the ritual track is a bit of a counter to this in the sense that um, in many games, it is the easiest strategy to simply build as much on the board, have the best production, and simply go after uh, the other players. Now, Nightmare Cathedral does not award you straight up points just for these things. It is not a game which you will, which is kind of easy to crack in the sense that there are simple ways of taking over the board or that there are specific points. And by points, I mean points on the map, areas on the map that you want to take because they are crucial. Every game will be slightly different due to those changing objectives. Everybody will have their own objectives in their hand, which are drawn from a common pool. So often it's also uh, the matter of how quickly you deal with certain objective to, objectives to be able to draw more that kind of work with the objectives you already have. In essence, everything you do in this game is kind of means to an end. Just winning conflicts against other players indeed gives you nothing apart from temporary or less temporary control of given regions. But it is uh, the but it is the objectives that will often tell you who you want to fight, how you want to win, and what areas you want to control. And once this objective is played, you can completely shift your strategy. You can tactically move somewhere else because the number of your followers is limited. Or, for example, after fulfilling a certain objective, you can move closer to uh, the ritual track and use your units from the board in order to be able to climb that ritual track. R the ritual track is important in the sense that it is the one thing that is always constant, that will always be there on the board uh, for you to use and for you to secure a certain number of points. However, the number of points from the ritual track and the number of points from objectives, objectives in the longer run will score you many more points if you follow them and try to weave them with the ritual track as well. Um, the next question is to summarize a little the process of talking to the museum, the approval for the final look and the praise given by the director yesterday. Um, so when it comes to the process, this, is, this was not exactly the job of the design or development team in this sense that here all of the props should, should go to Kuba Polkowski, who was the person who, who talked to the museum. And I cannot really talk much about his experience. I know that it was gr great working with the museum, and that is something that I was able to easily see, that it was simply... It, it was they were simply a great partner uh, also due to the fact that they were responsive and they were open now when it comes to the process itself um, we had to talk periodically to them just to make sure that they like certain depictions or that they like certain let's say um, text content that is put in the game but this is a very standard approval process you just want to know that whoever you're working with is okay. Now, the thing that was obvious, even to a person who wasn't in direct touch, which is me in this case, was that the game excited, um, that, that they were excited by the game, that they were very much on board, and that they were very supportive of, of what we were doing. Now, coming into the praise uh, that uh, the art was respected, like I said, one of the things I knew from the start is that we are getting access to this amazing, amazing art. That, and what we must do, what I must do when I design the game is to make sure that we can use it in a way that will make people look at this, look at look at a card, look at the board and say, wow, this, this is a cool landscape or this is a cool creature. So again... I wanted to build a game because you can say that um, so sometimes you want to work creatively within certain boundaries. And in this case, I felt that what I want to create as a boundary is the ability to make a game that will 
show off those different landscapes, but also kind of create a venue for them to be like big enough so that that they can be looked at and that they can be um, that they can be witnessed, that they can be fully um, fully experienced. So. I kind of knew that I, I want them as regions and I want them as regions which are separated from each other. I had this vision that they could that this could kind of represent in an amazing way all of those vistas, or well, not all of them, but a number of those vistas created by Bekshinsky. So one of the first things as I was deciding on the basic mechanism that kind of that kind of came to me as a vision was the board with different regions situ- situated in, in different places, uh, connected by, uh, by, by those smaller connections so that each region could be felt as something with its own atmosphere that, and that could be kind of enjoyed, that could be big enough that it can be enjoyed. And again, I, being a person who works with game for, a, for quite some time, I also know that it's a great thing to be able later down the road to have, for example, big enough spaces to keep all of your miniatures there comfortably and still be able to see where you are at. So this is one of the things. The second thing, again, was I knew that we wanted to use bigger cards because that would allow us to uh, put some of the rules on, on the cards while at the same time, if we put nightmares into the game, be able to present their images in a way that would that would make... Um, that would make you go, wow, this is a cool image. This is a cool idea. Um, so this is this is basically what was there from the start when it comes to um, to designing the game. Um, okay. Um, will there be expansions as part of the campaign? Um, I don't want to reveal too much. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the game and when it comes to uh, retail afterwards, when it comes to retail afterwards, this is not exactly a question I can answer right now. It will definitely be available in retail later, but um, I cannot exactly uh, tell you the details right now. What I what I can tell you is. Well, basically, if you're thinking about this long line of different expansions adding to this and to, to this side and to that side of the game, the answer is mostly no. Uh, when I designed the game and then when we went into development, we wanted to create a game that would be a very tightly knit experience, a game that is uh, rather easy to get into. But once you get into it, you see a certain interconnected system of different subtle uh, ideas and mechanisms that is something that becomes better and better as you play. And I felt that adding um, often many different expansions that loosen some parts of the game was never a good idea for this. In the end, it's a it's a very tight system that is always created between your abilities as player, your starting uh, kind of boon, which is the starting upgrade you're going to receive to one of your five actions, and the perspective of the two nightmares that are going to enter the game later, each of them with their own ability that also influences the way you can score points at the end of the game. And uh, yeah, okay, so I think... I think this is everything. I think these are um, all the questions we had here. So um, with that, thank you very much. I know that uh, this may have been slightly chaotic, but the truth is that the process of designing Nightmare Cathedral was something that, in a way, was, um, was a process that was slightly emotional to me. This is amazing and great art and the, from the moment I knew we were doing this, I felt so many ideas and so many and so many routes we can go down. So this was something that felt like there were at the same time multiple things I was trying to decide and calibrate. So just the the interaction, the daily interaction with this art 
was um, in a way an incredible experience and one that at the same time influenced me and my process of creating the game in many, many ways. All right. Uh, so thank you very much.